Hello and welcome to the Arise interview where we take time to reflect on the big stories from the news and on the fortunes and affairs of the world in an hour of conversation with commentators, analysts and thought leaders. I'm Sam Sambu. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, after chaotic, unprecedented move by pro-Trump rioters who stormed the Capitol buildings in a violent attempt to overturn the election results, Congress has confirmed Joe Biden as the next U.S. president. Donald Trump has finally conceded defeat. What leaders have reacted to the dramatic scenes at Capitol buildings, describing it as a direct attack on democracy? And President-elect Joe Biden says it's an assault on the most sacred of American undertakings and does not reflect America. There are reports that cabinet secretaries are discussing removing Trump by invoking the 25th Amendment. We'll speak to a Democrat, a Republican, a Nigerian diplomat, and our special correspondent. As after hundreds of President Trump's supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol in a harrowing assault on American democracy, a shaking Congress formally certified Democrat Joe Biden's election victory. More than six hours after the violence erupted, lawmakers resumed their session. Thirteen Republican senators and dozens of GOP representatives had planned to force debate and vote on perhaps six different states' votes. The assault on the Capitol made some Republicans shy away from trying to overturn Biden's win, and challenges were lodged only against Arizona and Pennsylvania. Both efforts lost overwhelmingly. Biden defeated Trump by 306 to 232 electoral votes and will be inaugurated on January 20th. Full number of electors appointed to vote for President of the United States is 538. Within that whole number, a majority is 270. The votes for President of the United States are as follows. Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware has received 306 votes. Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida has received 232 votes. The whole number of electors appointed to vote for Vice President of the United States is 538. Within that whole number, a majority is 270. The votes for Vice President of the United States are as follows. Kamala D. Harris of the state of California has received 306 votes. Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana has received 232 votes. The announcement of the state of the vote by the President of the Senate shall be deemed a sufficient declaration of the persons elected President and Vice President of the United States, each for the term beginning on the 20th day of January 2021, and shall be entered together with the list of the votes on the journals of the Senate and the House of Representatives. The purpose of the joint session having concluded, pursuant to Senate Concurrent Resolution 1, 117th Congress, the chair declares the joint session dissolved. Vice President uh, Mike Pence there. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined via Cisco Webex from Detroit, Michigan, by a Republican strategist, Earl Mockock. Good to have you, Earl. Let's talk about uh, the, the challenges facing your party with this uh, 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 dissent on uh, the Capitol building yesterday. How do you think Americans will be rating your party at this point in time, considering that your president, who's outgoing right now, uh, seems to have been accused of uh, you know, gathering all of these uh, thugs, mobs, and all of that, and uh, lots of Republican leaders have, though, condemned it, but it looks like uh, the backlash is against your party, actually. Uh, yeah, I would concur that in the, in the short run, the uh, optical backlash is, is certainly going to be against the Republican Party. Um, a couple things to note: uh, Donald Trump during the during the um, let's let's call it made for TV insurrection did condemn it. Uh, he has condemned it after the fact. The Republican leadership has condemned it. I condemn it. The Republican Party in general condemns it. What I will say is that Joe Biden won the presidency officially as of it looks like yesterday, and you know congratulations to him. But let's note that he won only seventeen percent 
government of the county in the United States. So if we're looking at those uh, agitators who showed up, um, do those people represent 50 percent of 87 percent of the counties in the United States? Probably not. A lot of those people were, you know, paid professionals who go all around the country creating chaos. They stormed the Capitol wearing you know, bear masks and, and face paint. They had no demands. They took a bunch of pictures. They went out front and took a group photo and they left. Um, it was embarrassing. It certainly wasn't something that we wanted to see. But in a lot of ways, uh, the kind of conflation, just as we don't point at the Antifa riots and say that represents the Democrat Party, we certainly don't look at those uh, agitators who um, created that, that mess there. But it certainly is good optics for the Democrat Party going forward and something that we need to uh, you know, get ahead of and make sure that that's nothing that represents our party whatsoever. Talk about the accusation by some of your party members that uh, the crowd there at uh, Capitol was actually infiltrated by Antifa members. How true is that? Well, we have no, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to honestly tell you if I know for a fact, but the fact is in a lot of these protests, there's subversive, subversive agents on all sides, as we saw in the, in the BLM, in the BLM protests that were co-opted by uh, violent agitators and extremists. So, well, I, I wouldn't say that the entire uh, group was, was, was infiltrated. There certainly were people who were there just who like to watch the world burn. Uh, there's there's the difference between that and the uh, you know sub suburbs and, and and family people that voted for Donald Trump. Those weren't the people we saw there today. But the 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 threat of uh, false flag agitators on all sides of the political spectrum is very clear and present, as we all know. And we also have some top Republicans actually condemning this act and saying that President Trump had uh, gone beyond his powers as president to actually call for this insurrection through his rhetoric saying that uh, the preceding hour before uh, Congress actually met uh, was full of vile rhetoric by the president calling on his supporters to descend on Washington, still accusing electoral officials of, um, you know, uh, fraud and all of that. What do you make out of, of that speech actually by President Trump before the Congress sat? Well, it's in the president's purview to pr uh, present his his point of view and, and the way that, you know, his 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 voters have seen this election, they they see that there was a decent amount of fraud in certain certain areas that they've identified. Uh, he never called for insurrection. I want to be very clear on that. He did uh, lead a march through Washington, or didn't lead the march, but went to a march that was permitted. And oftentimes, as we see with permitted marches, there are extreme contingents that break off and create um, abstract scenarios. So Donald Trump, uh, you know, he he was out there. He was you know with his base. And, and the people who came for that rally, the tens of thousands of people, you didn't see tens of thousands of people storm the Capitol. You saw, you know, a very small contingent. So uh, I think it was a mistake in, in, in some respects, but uh, that's the nature of third decade politics in, in, in the U.S. When you enter uh, the, the third decade, usually is when you start to see the real now, you know, push pull of generational clash. So uh, it, it, it wasn't uh, unexpected that it got out of hand, but it didn't get out of hand to the sense that, that we saw on uh, over the, the riots over the summer. There was no burning. There was no I mean, there was unfortunately one young lady lost her life. Uh, she was shot by the Capitol police and she was not following their orders believe me there's not gonna be riots in her name either burning down the, the cart so you know all, all said and done it's it's good optics to try to call it you know a, a seditious act or an insurrection but in actuality it was it was it was a bunch of sort of name thugs getting their instagram moment and donald trump quickly put an end to it despite the fact that uh it was a uh let's say unprecedented moment in u.s political history i'll say the least now what would want to wonder do do you think your party will be apologizing to Americans on the desecration of this national monument, this national institution? Because, I mean, like we've seen analysts saying that uh, in living memory, no American who is alive right now would have thought that something like this would be happening to the Capitol. So is your party planning to actually apologize to Americans? No. I no. Again, if this was like some a bunch of armed people who had you know run into there and 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 kept kept hostage and had a bunch of demands and were trying to literally take them the democratic process that we were supporting, that's one thing. Uh, I don't think we've we've gotten any apologies from uh, Joe Biden for for the uh, crazy acts of violence that were committed wrongly, and I'm certainly I'm sure not with his approval in his name. So no, we don't owe an apology to the American people. In fact, a, a great deal of our supporters were um, were very suspicious of that. Um, 
congressional hearing. So, um, you know, I think I think America as a whole needs to take stock of the situation that led us to that position. But uh, this this isn't the uh, the sin of the Republican Party that we need to apologize for. When when abstract actors uh, from outside of our our party co opt um, a very small fringe of, of our party, that's that's something that we all condemn as Americans together. So collectively, we should do that. And while the rest of the world is watching, a lot of people are wondering why it took President Donald Trump so long to concede victory. What are your thoughts on that? Well, quite simply, he's an outsider. Uh, he's he's a renegade. He's 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 not he's not an inside politician. He's he's not here for it to be a career. It's not a career move where he's 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 re weighing his re-election weights. Um, it's quite healthy to challenge um, challenge. Um, let's say. Uh, the, the the darkness, right? So only cockroaches are afraid of the light. If you can't stand up for, to an audit, if you can't stand up to questions on your democracy, you don't have one. So Donald Trump pushed and pushed and pushed, and they went through every single legal discourse, just like, keep in mind, that's the, the Al Gore standard. This isn't the Donald Trump's invention, a man who just entered the political sphere a mere four years ago. This has been going on for years. So eventually, in the end, as he said in the beginning, if the Electoral College and everything goes through, he will concede, which he did. But there's no shame in playing to the whistle. And a lot of his uh, supporters really appreciate that about him, that he wasn't going to go quietly into the night. And they're already rebuilding that base. Keep in mind, during that whole uh, lack of concession, he raised, I want to say, 300 to 400 million dollars for his re-election campaign. I mean, there's some element of political gamesmanship to to it also. And in the end, look at the stock market, the the look at the uh, the job numbers, look at the um, great developments from the science uh, sector in, in our vaccines. You know, we, we, we turn over a very prosperous country to Mr. Biden, and we hope that he's able to keep that ship on such an upward trajectory that we were able to guide it on. And of course, out of foreign wars, which is the biggest thing that we can walk away from here that we did not participate in. You actually mentioned some of the things that uh, the Trump presidency will be remembered for. And um, a lot of persons have actually said that the economy has witnessed a huge growth under Trump and all of that. Uh, what do you wish for Mr. Biden as he takes over on the 20th? I think one great thing that Mr. Biden can do um, that was uh, that, that, that Trump would have liked to do would be infrastructure. I think, you know, Trump uh, Biden's been handed a, a, a golden goose, if you can say. And because he has all three branches, things like infrastructure, which Trump's uh, strategic advisor would not have allowed him to do until uh, the second term are now open. So, I mean, while debt fueled expansion isn't exactly the purview of the Republican Party, um, there was an argument, at least from the Trump supporters, uh, that we wanted to see infrastructure. So if Joe Biden could really get in involved with uh, rebuilding American infrastructure and he um, looks at some of the prison or crime, you know, Joe Biden, of course, the famous author of that disastrous crime bill, especially for the African-American community, Donald Trump was able to make a lot of strides there. Hopefully Joe Biden can atone for his past sins and, and help uh, work towards a more equitable future there. So there's a lot of positives. Keep in mind, we're not against uh, America. We're not the resistance. This isn't, you know, the, the, the what happened in the last four years. We we support America. When Joe Biden is, is, is officially inaugurated on the 20th, he's my president, just as he is everybody's president. And everybody in our, in our, in our party who's a serious, respected individual is going to admit that. So, you know, we'd like to really see Joe Biden also follow Donald Trump's uh, lead in, in, in the international sphere. We've given him a great advantage with China. He has a lot of cards he can use and leverage if he wants to walk back into a more Chinese American sphere. So that's another positive. And with Iran as well, he now has a lot of cards that if he wants to rejoin those talks, Iran has proven themselves to be at the very least a um, less trust, less than trustworthy actor. And, and so Joe Biden has been given a lot of geopolitical cards that he can play. And he's got that sort of trifecta at home that could really be a stimulus package for uh, American infrastructure, which I think would, would be a boon for all of America, despite the uh, initial cost overlay. And I'm not sure that's the view of my party, but that's, that's what I would tell you. Right, Errol Mocock, a Republican strategist, thanks so much for speaking to us from Detroit, Michigan. And I really love that part you talked about of the protesters, that some of them were actually trying to get some Instagram moments there. I mean, that's what usually happens during situations like that. Really nice speaking with you. At least four White House officials have resigned after the Capitol breach, and there are reports that more would follow. The resignations follow the assault on the heart of U.S. democracy that has been condemned by all sides and globally. 
Footage has emerged from inside the Capitol of the moment when pro-Trump supporters stormed the building and managed to breach both chambers of Congress. Police and security officers were overwhelmed by the scale of the attack and appeared unprepared for the onslaught that unfolded. Members of Congress were evacuated and were forced to shelter in secure locations. One woman was shot dead by security forces inside the building. Three others died after what have been described as medical emergencies. The mayor of Washington has, this, has extended a state of emergency for 15 days to ensure peace and security through the inauguration of President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. And I'm now being joined via Cisco Webex by the spokesperson for Democrats Abroad, UK, John Scadino. Good to have you, John. Thank and, you. Uh, I think <laughs> let's begin with um, how you're severing the moment after uh, Joe Biden was actually ratified by Congress alongside uh, Kamala Harris. How did you feel during that moment after all the chaos that happened yesterday? Well, I'm, I'm very... Uh, very pleased that uh, it has been made official by the U.S. Congress. Um, I, th I think yesterday there was there was quite a lot of of things to celebrate. Uh, obviously, not in in the attack on the Capitol, but um, in addition to the certification of uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, also in in the state of Georgia, which is my my home state, um, we had a, a, a an enormous victory having elected. Um, um, Pastor um, Ralph Warnock to the U.S. Senate, the first uh, African American from uh, a Southern state, um, and we also elected uh, John Ossoff, both in the state of Georgia, uh, two Democratic um, Senate candidates who were um, running against and have beaten uh, Republican incumbents. So that was an enormous victory, and will um, switch the control of the U.S. Senate from the Republicans to the Democrats, and will support Joe Biden in a number of the legislative goals that he has to address, number one, the uh, coronavirus crisis that uh, President Trump uh, is leaving uh, the president-elect Biden with. Uh, I think that that is one of the, the great crises, the, the first thing that, that President uh, Biden will have to deal with. Now, let, let's talk about um, what happened yesterday in Washington at the Capitol. I mean, lots of anxieties, not just in the U.S., but across the world. But a lot of people are saying that there was a failure of security, failure of intelligence by the security services, not just the police alone. And uh, I would just want to give you a quote by one of the protesters. He had joked that yesterday that, in court, they didn't even fight back, said one man, uh, you know, who was um, talking um, about the police. They just stood there, watched them, which is the normal practice. But at the point when it was getting out of hand, we had thought that there will be a lot of reinforcement and we shouldn't have allowed that situation to degenerate to the extent of these protesters getting into the chambers. What do you make of that failure of intelligence, failure of security provision by the police and uh, the capital security. Well, I, I think that's a good point. And, and what happened yesterday at the Capitol was, was shocking. There's, there's no way about it. Um, it is surprising that the, the people who stormed the, the, the U.S. Capitol building got as far as they did and got into the Senate chamber and the House chamber um, and, and in some cases um, apparently were leaving um, explosive devices and there and, and also at the Republican National Headquarters and potentially elsewhere in Washington. So it is it is a shocking failure of, of the security around the Capitol. Um, I'm not sure what to make of it, really, whether that was uh, a, um, a strategic move on the part of the Capitol Police um, in, in feeling that they were overwhelmed and didn't have any, any option um, but to allow um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't, I don't think that there was anything, <coughs> excuse me, I don't think that there was, they weren't uh, welcoming uh, the rioters in with open arms, but I, but I think at some point 
they certainly felt like they were outnumbered, as, as you said. Um, it is a real surprise and disappointment that the Capitol Police didn't have the, the support of other police forces uh, that they should have had. Um, as you, you may know, in Washington, the Capitol Police have a very specific role in looking after the Capitol building and that area where the lawmakers uh, meet and vote and, and conduct their business. Um, there's also the, the U.S. Park Police. As you know, Washington is composed of a lot of monuments and parks, and the Park Police are a very large force looking after great sections of, of Washington. But ultimately, they had to. They called in the um, uh, the, the National Guard. They requested support from the National Guard. Um, and my understanding is that that, that uh, request went directly to President Trump and that the request was denied, which was in itself shocking. Um, the National Guard is controlled in every state. They, it's controlled by the governor. So if in Georgia, for example, the, the governor of Georgia wanted to call in the National Guard for an emergency, the governor has the authority to do that. In Washington is is a unique kind of entity because it's not a state. Um, it is a city, as the name implies, the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C. Um, the mayor doesn't have the authority to uh, call in the National Guard and has to submit a request for support directly to the president because it is the federal government that controls, ultimately has control in, in Washington. So it, it is a, a real shock that the request went to President Trump for support and, and he uh, denied the request. Ultimately, the vice president, Mike Pence, uh, I understand, was the one who did approve for, for the National Guard to come in. John, let's talk about what lots of Americans and um, even people outside um, the country are actually saying about the role that uh, Vice President Mike Pence played yesterday. I mean, he's been touted as a hero of democracy for upholding constitutionalism, for not allowing President Trump uh, to actually infiltrate his mindset, considering the role that he had to play yesterday. What do you make of that act uh, of constitutionalism, um, which uh, Mike Pence you know, talked to um, all through yesterday, even at the risk well, of his listen, life? It's, <laughs> it's, you know, normally this event, this certification that we're talking about, the, the, the House and the Senate get together, and this is normally a very boring, um, you know, uneventful event that happens every four years after a, a president has been elected that the the house and the senate get together and they essentially you know put the the stamp of approval on uh what the the states have already done and what the voters in each state have already done and uh the vice president has absolutely no authority whatsoever and never has to stop that process and this is the, the, another of the shocking things about Donald Trump was that he was um, um, broadcasting these untruths that uh, Vice President P Pence would have the ability to come in and somehow stop the process. Pence never had that that power. It's not. It's it's. He doesn't have the ability. The Constitution doesn't give him the authority to stop something like that. All the Vice President can do is is preside over the the ceremony of what's happening and and recognize that it's that it's going through but vice president pence never had the authority to to do anything other than accept to the result i, I think it was um sort of re remarkable i suppose of pence to to finally say to to donald trump uh look I, I can't do what you asked me to do. I don't have the power to do that. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't do it. Uh, and and when he finally did say that to Donald Trump, um, as he is wont to do, President Trump doesn't like to have anybody contradict him. So he got very upset with Pence and, and um, said some unpleasant things about him. Now, John, let's talk about uh, the resignation of uh, most of, of, of uh, the outgoing President uh, Trump and uh, the plans by some of his cabinet members to invoke the 25th Amendment and actually make uh, plans to enjoy the remaining two weeks, <laughs> if that's possible, before uh, Biden is sworn in. What do you make of that and how feasible do you think that is within just these last two weeks we have left? 
It's it's tricky to be honest with you because uh, while there are there are two options that that Congress has, one is uh, as you say invoking the Twenty Fifth Amendment, um, which allows for uh, the Vice President to send a letter to Congress to say uh, the President is unfit uh, to govern and he should be removed. And if the Vice President has the support of, um, I believe. Uh, he, has, he needs a minimum of eight of the cabinet members in the current circumstances. If eight members of the cabinet support that letter, the vice president and the cabinet would then send it to Congress and um, and ask for the president to be removed. Um, the other option is for impeachment, uh, which is a, a longer and more complex process. And we saw that um, uh, a while ago. Um, Donald Trump was, in fact, impeached by the House of Representatives, but uh, when it got to the Senate, which was controlled by his party, the Republicans, um, th that was denied by only a, a, a couple of votes, um, unfortunately, and he remains an impeached president, but they didn't take the final step of, of implementing the, the impeachment. The, the problem with the, um, the 25th Amendment at, at this stage of the game, and, and as you said, uh, Donald Trump only has a couple of more weeks at most to before he would be out of office anyway. The problem with the 25th Amendment is that the vice president can send a letter to Congress and say this president should be removed. And if Congress, uh, once Congress has that letter, um, then the president can submit a, sub a subsequent letter presenting his point of view and challenging the vice president's letter so then Congress has to decide uh, sort of between the two letters and which one it's, it's going to act on. And that whole process could take several weeks. So, the other thing we do not have enough time. I mean, it's been nice um, hearing your thoughts on all of this. And I wish you all Democrats um, the best uh, uh, of luck ahead as uh, we prepare for January 20th when uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will actually be sworn in. Nice speaking with you. You're still watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead including world leaders react with shock after Trump supporters riot at the U.S. Capitol. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Sumner Sambu. The massive breach at Capitol Hill has raised questions about the security failure in the United States. World leaders and top lip diplomats express strong condemnation of the political chaos in the U.S. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson described the incident as disgraceful and terribly distressing was the reaction of Australia's leader Scott Morrison. Former U.S. President Barack Obama said the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol was a moment of great dishonor and shame for our nation, but we had been kidding ourselves if we treated it as a total surprise. French President Emmanuel Macron also commented on the issue. I just wanted to express our friendship and our faith in the United States. What happened today in Washington DC is not America, definitely. We believe in the strength of our democracies. We believe in the strength of American democracy. Absolutely terrible in terms of the violence, um, the activities that we've seen. We've just seen, you know, confidence in democracy being shattered, quite frankly, and there's no justification for the level of violence, full stop that was on show and has been on display and people have been assaulted, people have died. Um, we've also seen, you know, law enforcement officers being assaulted too. And it's really sad, it's tragic to see actually on the basis that, you know, America has always been a fantastic beacon of democracy, liberty, freedom, um, you know, just great values of tolerance, decency and democracy. So no question, absolutely no question at all, just really terrible scenes. The violence, you know, should stop and he should, he should absolutely um, condemn everything that has taken place. Um, you know, there's no question about that at all. Someone was shot, people have died. Um, this is terrible, terrible beyond words, quite frankly, and there is no justification for it. And I'm now being joined by Cisco Webex by Ambassador Joe Keshi, 
who is a former consul general at the Nigerian mission in Washington, D.C. And in the studio by Arise Special Correspondent, Carl Bostic. Good to have you, Carl. Let's go to you straight, Ambassador. Uh, what do you make of what's going on in Washington right now? At least there's a respite. Uh, Congress has eventually uh, ratified uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But how are you looking at this from this part of the world, actually? Well, I, I think it's uh, unfortunate. And everybody has um, uh, used one adjective or the other to uh, describe what happened uh, yesterday. And uh, I got a phone call this morning from somebody who said, uh, you actually predicted that this would happen because uh, we all seem to know Donald Trump uh, very well. Yes, it's an assault on uh, democracy, especially to, you know, American democracy that uh, has been the beacon and the, the a country that continue to uh, advocate for democracy all over the world. So it, it's, it's honestly very shameful to use the words that, uh, the, the kind of words that uh, Donald Trump likes to, to use all the time. It's very, very shameful, unexpected, I mean, unexpected and uh, uh, condemnable. And I'm glad that uh, the world is condemning it. I'm glad that the British and the rest, the, you know, everybody is standing up uh, to let Donald Trump know that, uh, you know, this is unacceptable and that, uh, this is not America that everybody knows and admire. Keshi, a lot of Africans are surprised that African leaders have been mute in all of this. While this is happening, we haven't seen statements coming out from Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt, and all of that condemning what actually happened yesterday. And if the reverse had been the case, I'm very sure you know what the United States would have done. What do you make of that silence by African leaders? Number one, as uh, Professor Akinyemi once advocated, silence is a, it's a policy in itself to start with. <laughs> silence, silence is a policy in itself. Number two, I'm surprised that uh, you're actually surprised that uh, African leaders or African countries have not issued any statement. This is not, it is not their character to do things like this and we shouldn't be surprised. We are too weak. We are too weak in the continent to want to take such a, a route. So um, let's leave the continent out of it. Let's begin to think of what lessons can we all learn from what has just happened in Washington, both in this country and uh, you know all over the world. I think it's the lessons that we should be uh, thinking of now. What lessons should we, uh, what are the takeaways from what happened yesterday? Before this election, we had had the International Crisis Group actually warning that the U.S. democracy may actually be in danger if the institutions in that country do not work very well. Let me read out what the uh, Crisis Group had actually said. It has said that beyond the implications for any Americans caught up in unrest, the election will be a harbinger of whether its institutions can guide the U.S. safely through a period of social political change. If not, the world's most powerful country could face a period of growing instability and increasingly diminished credibility abroad. And I want to focus on that last part. How much do you think the U.S. will have a diminished credibility abroad after this incident? No, I don't. I don't think the U.S. with uh, with the incoming president. I don't. I think a, a lot of changes would uh, take place. But we also have to look at the last four years and give some credit and give some credit to the American institutions. They've been very resilient. They've stood up against uh, Donald Trump. If they've not done, if they've not, uh, you know, um, been, if, they, if the institutions were not strong enough, Donald Trump would have completely destroyed America. The fact that institutions stood up to him in so many ways, you know, including Congress going as far as to impeaching him, and uh, you know, uh, yesterday again, immediately, immediately, um, you could see that immediately after um, uh, the unfortunate incident at the Capitol, you could see that Congress convened and and almost immediately, you know, began to work to show that democracy is still alive in the United States. So we must give some kudos, uh, kudos to 
the institutions. And, and that brings me to, you know, I like to link this up to, uh, you know, to our own situation here. We also must begin to appreciate the strength and the necessity to build very strong institutions that nobody can destroy. You know, I've been joking about this uh, to my friends and everybody yesterday that, uh, number one, if this was Africa, the African president does not call a secretary of state and begin to say, I, I'm begging for votes. No, you bring the guy down, put him in prison or get uh, somebody else to take his job and declare you the winner. So we must all appreciate that there are lessons to be learned from this. And I always say to people, if you don't know what to do, watch television, you learn a lot. We can learn a lot by just watching television. And from that, we can begin to see how we can build not just in strong institutions, but how to organize ourselves, uh, you know, in this uh, part of the uh, part of the world. For me, I think that uh, the America, American institutions have been very resilient and they stood as much as they can, they, they, you know, they stood on the way of President Trump from completely destroying uh, the United States. You just hold your thoughts there while we speak with our special correspondent here. Uh, Carl, let's take a look at all of this that have happened and then we've seen some resignation from Trump's aides and uh, there, are this, uh, uh, there is this information going around that uh, some of the cabinet members may be invoking the 25th Amendment and all of that. How feasible do you think that is considering that we just have about 14, uh, let's just say two weeks left before he, he exits? That's right, less than two weeks, uh, Sumner, and yet uh, the, the deep unease uh, in the White House uh, uh, on Capitol Hill and uh, uh, um, amongst cabinet members, it's an unease that's, that's really growing into almost a conviction that uh, each day he spends in the White House, each passing day, is a possible threat to uh, the country uh, in terms of possible future violence or, or even um, possible deaths. However, it's... Uh, easier said than done. Let's look at some of the headlines that have been moving today. If we, have, if we can show you one or two of the headlines right now, for example, uh, I think we have one from uh, the Washington Post, if we can show you that, uh, where it says, Trump caused the assault on the Capitol, he must be removed. And uh, then this, this uh, particular image continues to show uh, the beginning of this editorial from the Washington Post, uh, where it simply says that, uh, uh, the blame really stops with him, and uh, that's, that's uh, about maybe the kid glove treatment, but there's also something from the New York Times uh, that talks about maybe the double standard that was practiced by the police, but there was also uh, mention in the New York Times that he should be removed. Uh, here we are again talking about the double standard of, uh, of the security, but I want to return to uh, the 25th Amendment, if I could, uh, it, it, there was a, the 25th Amendment is, a, is the one that would actually, um, uh, this is, this is uh, the uh, National Association of Manufacturers. It's significant somewhere because you're talking about hundreds of manufacturers of businesses, including banks. <coughs> and they uh, issued a statement saying that Vice President Pence should uh, consider <coughs> invoking the 25th Amendment. So what exactly is the 25th Amendment? I think the next uh, slide we can show you explains just what that, what that slide is. And it basically says that whenever the vice president and a majority of principal officers of executive departments, what that means is the cabinet, Sumner, yeah. that those cabinet members, a majority of the cabinet, or any select body of Congress, uh, if they uh, transmit, in other words, send a note to the head of the Senate that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the vice president <coughs> shall immediately assume the powers and duties of the office as acting president. Uh, that kind of discussion is going on right now. However, it cannot be taken too seriously, Sumner, unless really you've got uh, senior Republicans on the House side of Congress and the Senate side also, in, to that. also kind of embracing that. So the range of options really are really very limited, Sumner. With only, like, only like 12, 13 days remaining until Joe Biden's sworn in. They range from censure, which would have little impact, impeachment, which would have to happen now. And again, it's possible, but you really are talking about fast-tracking everything. Yeah, but in all but of this, uh, uh, Trump is actually mentally fit, based on what we've seen here. Well, He's walking <coughs> around, doing lots of things here and there. 
it looks <coughs> like this cannot actually happen. <laughs> I mean, it's very, very clear. You could see uh, to the kind of pressure that uh, Pence has been through uh, uh, all these days uh, from Pence and all of that. Do you think that uh, Pence would want to go uh, overboard again to actually want to invoke all of this? Because, I mean, with this few days Two left, things, a lot Sandra, of persons say all, you should just relax. Sandra, I have to disagree with you. It's a call on mentally fit. If anything, right now is being called unhinged. I mean, here's a person who refuses to accept that he's lost, uh, despite all those different rounds of certifications that have happened. He refuses to accept that he's lost. He refuses to concede. He won't even congratulate Joe Biden. He, he maintains that uh, it was still stolen or rigged and such. Uh, the, these are, this is not the, the conduct of behavior of someone who's really accepting reality. Well, he's dissent, and, 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 and I mean, I mean attorney any, general, anyone attorney who's general said, such a thing would... His attorney general said it was a fair election, that there's no evidence of widespread fraud. The head of cybersecurity, again, said it was the safest, most secure U.S. election in ever in U.S. history. And then uh, subsequently, uh, President Trump uh, fired him. So it has little to do with his not a, a, accept. You know, his being mentally fit, it's just, it's just his judgment right there. Oh, where he basically all right, just hold your thoughts. I've been told we have to go on a break right now. You're still watching the Rise interview. Plenty more still ahead. Stay with us. <music> Welcome back to the Arise interview. And we still have here with us um, Arise special correspondent, Carl Bostic, and alongside uh, Ambassador Joe Keshi, who has been with us. Thank you, Ambassador, for still uh, being with us. Now, let's talk about um, some of the issues that have come out of this, apart from the world leaders condemning it. Uh, there, there's this fear among some intellectuals, too, that some African countries may copy this kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, style. And then you have, you know, uh, lots of NGOs, lots of uh, uh, people who do not agree with the system trying to uh, invade parliaments and all of that. How do you think this can be prevented so that people do not use this as a standard uh, for dissent in African countries? For, for me? Yes, go is, ahead. Is that for me? Oh, okay, thank you. Look, I, I, I don't think that, I don't think that uh, what Trump did is uh, um, it, it's uh, uh, how do you put it now? Uh, it's anything that African leaders would like to emulate. I, I believe in some countries we have even done worse things than that. So there's nothing, absolutely nothing to emulate, you know. But democracy is just beginning to take hold in the continent. And uh, I, I just think that the, the worst that happens in Africa is that. Um, uh, some presidents don't want to go when their terms are almost over, and then they want a third term, they want a fourth and a fifth term, like you have in uh, some countries around uh, around us here today. So that's not the lesson we should, uh, you know, we should learn, or that's not a lesson for us to to learn. What Trump did is uniquely Trump. That's the honest truth that we must face. It's uniquely Trump, and I don't think that. Um, uh, anybody would do that in Africa as of today. In those days, yes. What we do in Africa is different from what happened in uh, We don't do all this in Africa. Even before the number one no African president would uh, go and start telling crowd to invade anywhere. Before then, they would have arrested all the opposition leaders and locked them up and declared themselves president. So that's not, there's nothing to learn from what happened yesterday because we have, it's uniquely Trump, and we also have our own unique way of dealing with our own uh, problems. So I don't think that it will occur in the continent. I'm not, I, I can almost predict that it will not occur. Or let me put it this way. That's not our style. We have our own style, but that's not the way we do things in, uh, you know, I joked with a friend of mine yesterday. I said, I mean, even uh, today, I said, look, if Trump had consulted us in Africa, we would have told him, we would have showed him how to rig election. You don't call a secretary of state and say, please give me votes. No. You, you know how to, we know how to get these votes in this continent. So let's, there, there's no lesson to learn from Trump over this. It's uniquely what happened. It's unfortunate and it's been condemned. And uh, for me, I don't think there's, uh, there's any lesson to be learned from that because we have done worse things in terms of uh, both during the military and uh, in recent times in Africa.
to go ambassador there's uh, this diplomatic statement from russia yesterday which i thought was undiplomatic well russia had said that uh, the u.s electoral system is archaic and uh, the politicization of the media uh, is responsible for all that we saw yesterday uh, what do you make of uh, this uh, statement from russia and do you think uh, it was actually hitting um, uh, the u.s below the belt how archaic indeed, if true, is the U.S. electoral system? Look, I, I think what you should uh, bear in mind is that a number of anti-American countries like Russia, they, they found a very good opportunity to poke, uh, to poke fun. They are making, they're just making fun and enjoying themselves. They're just making fun at what happened yesterday in, uh, in uh, in, in America. And I think the Iranians too have issued statements, you know, and every country that uh, suffered under Trump or that was isolated under Trump, I just found an opportunity to um, make fun of the United States, you know, um, yesterday. But what happened yesterday was not typically American. It was just the, the effort of an ambitious, you know, leader uh, to perpetuate himself in, in office and haven't failed going to the, to the law, legal system and with no evidence to back his claims of a rigged election, this, you know, decided to go to the street and organize some, uh, you know, ruffians to, to harass or embarrass uh, members of, uh, of Congress. I, I, again, I make the point that this is just uniquely uh, Trump and a number of countries are now speaking up some are very serious, like the British and the French and the Canadians and the rest. They've made very valid points. But the Russians are just having fun at the expense of the Americans. That's all. At this point, uh, Ambassador Joe Kieshi, who's a Nigeria's former Consul General um, in the United States, thanks so much for being with us. Now, let me come back to you, Carl. Uh, there's this book written by Mary Trump, who's a niece to uh, Donald Trump. And in that uh, book, when she released it, she has said that um, uh, there, there was a challenge, actually, within the family, with their granddad and all of that, and that uh, Trump was one of those who actually got some traits from their granddad that uh, the U.S., uh, uh, that U.S. citizens should be aware of. So in her opinion, she has said that um, she feels, in her opinion, and she's struggling to see how Americans will accept this kind of person, saying that President Donald Trump struggles to control his impulses, he struggles to tell the truth, learn new facts, apologize for mistakes, and lives in constant terror of having people perceive his flaws. Do you think at this point in time that Mary Trump's projection of Trump is correct. Well, you could argue uh, some of that really. All of those traits that she talks about from the narcissism to uh, uh, the refusal to uh, accept the truth, in fact, uh, to chronically uh, uh, lie, uh, to never apologize, for example. For mistakes and all of that. All of those traits, Senator, you could argue, crystallized and came together in a, in a perfect storm yesterday. Because in, in front of an enduring crowd, you know, once again, while votes were being certified, you know, he spewed off baseless conspiracy theories that were lies after more than 50 lawsuits had been rejected by state courts and twice by the Supreme Court, rejecting uh, all of these baseless lies and, and accusations that there was a systematic fraud uh, and that the election had been uh, stolen, had been rigged, and those kinds of things. But more, but more tellingly, even though he issued a statement uh, after the certification of Joe Biden's uh, as the next president, he simply uh, issued a statement saying that there'd be an orderly transition. transition he, 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 didn't, <laughs> he didn't concede that he had lost. He will never admit that he lost, which is maybe a psychological trait. He didn't con congratulate Joe Biden, and he actually kind of, it was a half-hearted response. And in fact, when he told the, 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 the mob of uh, people who had stormed the Capitol uh, to go home, it was half-hearted. He waited two and a half hours before putting together a hastily 
uh, put together a video for Twitter that was scripted for him by his staff. Uh, yes, that he, he went we offline. We don't have enough time. There's this burning question I actually want you to, to, okay. to, to answer. Uh, lots of um, uh, U.S. citizens that I've read online have been saying that if it were the Black Lives Movement that actually protested at the Capitol yesterday, there could have been lots of bloodshed here and there. Do you think that there were double standards by the security services? Well, that's been echoed right now, <coughs> now in the press. If we can show you one or two headlines right now very quickly, Sumner, we have you know, one headline uh, from the newspapers that, that make this point that you're just referring to. If we can look at that, it says there was click kick glove treatment, a pro-Trump mob of contrast with strong arm police tactics against Black Lives Matter. What they're referring to in the protest during the summer, especially in Louisville, where Breonna Taylor was killed by police, during those protests they used rubber bullets and tear gas and also batons against the protesters. Here uh, at the Capitol, the doors were in fact being opened for them. Yeah, they I mean, were, they were, <laughs> with they windows were, being shattered <coughs> and all were, of that. They were taking selfies. And let's look at another comment by the New York Times. I think we have another comment from uh, one of the newspapers about the double standard here. If we can look at that uh, slide for you in which uh, they talk about this double standard. Uh, the Capitol breach, uh, no, that's about impeaching and convicting right now, which is what the New York Times is saying. But just before this slide, if we look at it again, if we can go back to that, uh, the Capitol breach draws sharp condemnation of law enforcement, <coughs> excuse me, because of the double standard. And there's a, a very interesting quote, Sumner, if we can draw up that quote yeah. for you uh, very quickly from the New York Times, if we have this quote from this article about the double we'll standard. Just move on. We don't have it, but you know, well, there's this thing that's being said clearly there that the Capitol Police <coughs> were clearly outnumbered and it looks like they, they were unprepared for it. Do we have that quote that we can show you? Well, Basi it's not available right now. Okay, okay. Well, basically, it was a, a lawmaker from uh, uh, Louisville who was simply saying that, you know, if it was a black person, you know, it would have been tear gassed and rubber bullets, but if you're white and you riot, it's no problem. Nothing will happen to you. And that's, that's the feeling right there, this double standard. Uh, not only you have 2,000 Capitol Police, you know, on duty there, and they were lax and they didn't <laughs> resist them entering. <laughs> they didn't arrest them. They opened doors for them. They took selfies with them. So like, whose side were they on? And who were they protecting? But to put things in final, final context is this, Sumner. When we talk about the kind of threat it was to American democracy very, very quickly, let's look at the Civil War where the country was torn apart. You know, the Civil War, you had the North against the South, the Confederacy, which is basically trying to overthrow the Union and secede to preserve the right of slavery, to preserve white supremacy. The Confederacy, they never even got close to the Capitol. This was an armed occupation of the Senate and the House, temporarily at least. Yeah, with the Confederate flag even the, right inside <coughs> the building. And they never, the Confe during the Civil War, they never even got that close to the Capitol. And the last thought is this, that Confederate flag, such, such, such an insult, just only a day after Georgia elected the first Democrat black senator from the Deep South to the U.S. Senate. Now, and, just before we go quickly, how embarrassed do you think Mr. Trump's allies in the Republican Party are at the moment? And do you think the Republican National Committee should be um, um, uh, apologizing <coughs> to Americans it's for, not a, for it's what has happened uh, <coughs> because of its uh, president? Sumner, it's more than embarrassment. The, the party's torn apart. I think what's happened is now you've seen a real rupture, a real break uh, of the party with Donald Trump. Uh, where you have Lindsey Graham, one of his closest allies, saying on the Senate floor, uh, I can't go any further. Count me out. Uh, you have Mitch McConnell, one of his staunchest allies, saying that uh, this is sending democracy into a death spiral. So right now, uh, and again, this one, one final thought is this. In one term alone, he's lost the House to the Democrats, he's lost the, the Senate, Senate, and, and he's now lost the White, the White House. House. So well. what kind of leadership can he provide the Republicans <laughs> moving well, forward? Well, th thanks so much, uh, Carl Bostic, Arise New Special Correspondent. I want to thank all our guests earlier on that we had on the show. Well, that's it for this edition of the Arise interview with me, Somna Sambo. Do join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Goodbye, and thank you for watching. <laughs>